right, ladies and germs, we're back today. We're going to be talking about Marxism, capitalism. We're going to be talking with somebody who's an excellent writer and a political theorist and professor, uh, Jody Dean. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just fabulous. I got my tea here and I'm ready to talk about uh, economics and uh, you name it. Um, so you've written, what, 13 books? Written or edited. So uh, if we get really, you know, um, you know, creating the proper chart, I have nine singly um, authored books and five um, edited or co-edited books. And I'm now I'm now trying to get my 10th book written. So but but again, if we count the whole thing, it's like 14 total edited and written. Not too shabby. And the majority of these are on uh, communism or Marxism or or. Capitalism or feudalism? Well, so I think of my um, publishing, you know, my single books in sort of like in kind of three bunches. So my initial, um, my, not counting my dissertation, which was my first book, um, which was on the notion of solidarity. And then I have some books that are kind of in the more general cultural studies area, about three of those. Then I have a kind of middle period where I'm writing about kind of democracy and technology. And then my last um, three or four books, you know, including the edited volumes, are around communism, um, from the Communist Horizon to then the, um, the book Crowds and Party, which is kind of doubling down. It's like, oh, you like communism? Well, let's go for the party. Let's like, you know, be clear about that. And then, you know, once we're in the party, what's the proper um, norm or relationship among people in the party? And that's comradeship. So my most recent book is Comrade, an essay on political belonging. And so those would be, that'd be part of the communism trilogy. And now I'm working on a book on neo-feudalism. Cool. Uh, when what what inspired you originally to write uh, uh, Comrade? I mean, what, what do you? What's your motivation? What are you hoping that people are going to find out about? Um, so, I'll, those are actually like two different questions. So, the first, the difference between what motivated me and what I hope they'll get, because the motivation's not so glamorous. <laughs> the motivation was like, oh God, I'm doing like lots and lots of invited lectures and traveling all the time. So, what can I write without doing a whole lot of work <laughs> or a whole bunch of research? <laughs> and what can I write where I'm like just like talking to the interesting people around me and seeing what they think about stuff? And so I started talking to folks about um, comrades because I had noticed like weirdly in um, the kind of great books of the Marxist tradition, almost no one talks explicitly about what is expected of a comrade. But they, they're different people who might, they'll throw in, they call everybody comrade, but they weren't saying like, well, what, is, what does it mean to be a comrade? Or who is my comrade? Or how do you know what a comrade is? What do we expect of comrades? And I was kind of surprised not to see more about that. So I started, I, after I had this question in my head, I started talking to different people about it. And so what motivated me was like, oh, this is something that I can do because it's a, it's a thought question. It wasn't going to require like enormous amounts of archival research is going to require like finding like dipping in and then reflecting and then talking to a lot of people like um for example i was talking to some um you know old italians by old like you know their late 70s early 80s and i'm, I'm like so how did you guys use the term comrade in your i didn't this, i didn't put this in the book i will see for obvious reasons um and, and and they'd be like oh comrade that means maybe they'll sleep with me after the meeting <laughs> <laughs> they were joking, right? Joking, they're joking. Uh, but but I kind of loved this. Like, you know, like because in some ways they, you know, in the late sixties they probably weren't totally joking, but they also knew that that it had to be more to it. So um but it was a lot this book came about with, you know, talking with different folks who in the current communist communist milieu, everyone kind of thinking about the past as having more comradeship, more belief, more faith. And so what did folks mean about what did they? What in the, inspired them to be comrades in a party? You know, and what was their connection with one another? Like one person um, in, in Ireland, when um, I you know was talking to her, she came up and she said one of the most important experiences of her life was the first time she went into a party meeting and someone addressed her as comrade. 
And she felt like immensely like, oh, yes, this great historic responsibility is on me and I am a part of a chosen group of people. So, so this has been, so this came into the, the part, what I wanted people to get out of it. What I wanted people is to feel a sense of the kind of seriousness, like being a communist is not kind of sitting around and like, you know, arguing with people um, in some sort of online forum. Being a communist requires commitments and sacrifices and a different sort of relationality and so that's what i that's what i hope people got out of the book that i wrote in airports there there is a lot of infighting and 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 you know struggles over certain labels and stuff but isn't it, it is rooted in this collective kind of sacrificing let me negotiate with you and let's come to a kind of that's the vibe right yeah, I think the vibe is really like we're on the same side. And because we're on the same side, we have expectations of each other. And I can call on you to do things for me that I wouldn't for, you know, of anybody else. So like I can ex I can expect you to show up. If you're my party comrade, I expect you to show up for the demonstration, for the meeting, for all of the different things we have to do in ways I'm not going to expect people outside the party. It means like in one of the um, it, 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 one of the examples that I use from a, a um, Russian novelist, Platonov, it's like the comrade is the one who will wipe the flies off your back. And so there's a lot that you can that you expect of a comrade that you wouldn't of like your next door neighbor, your next door neighbor, at the, the very least you expect them to like, not, I don't know, to clean up after their dog or something, but you don't expect them to, to go all out in a way that you do with your comrades. And we need to be able to expect people to do those things, right? We have to have that kind of unity and political struggle. So not everybody can be our comrade. Like that's important. Not everybody's my comrade. Yeah. Oh, I hear that fully, <laughs> fully. How do you think capitalism impedes the, the, the roles that we are supposed to have for each other, this community-oriented collectiveness? How does the modern capitalistic world kind of interfere with our ability to be there for each other? So, capital... The the interest, so I think there's there's two ways to think about this. In the first place, capitalism utterly turns us into individuals. It makes us utter, competitive with one another and breaks all kinds of relationality, except for things that are instrumental in order to achieve some kind of gain, most of the time some kind of profit. Right? So capitalism destroys human relationships in the interest of profit. On the other hand, it depends on the very kinds of relationships that it undermines. So, for example, capitalism depends on people making food and doing laundry, right? Whether or not that somebody at home who one is fortunate enough will do these things or whether or not one purchases that, you know, that food or those laundry services, there are forms of relationship that um, capitalism depends on. It depends on a next generation, right? It depends on children growing up and learning to do the jobs that the, you know, the past generation had done. Um, so, com so capitalism depends on relationships, but it always undermines them. And that's part one of the tensions or kind of contradictions um, of capitalism. Comradeship is a relationship of struggle, right? A relationship when we're, we're on one side against those other people, right? It's a part of a relationship of struggle that can, can capitalist conditions generate, right? We have to fight. Um, and we have to, you know, we have to know, you know, what the people on our, our side that we can rely on them. We have to fight um, to essentially, you know, overcome these capitalist trend, um, conditions, destroy these capitalist conditions, or at least at the very least sort of secure some kind of benefit under these conditions. Let's say if we're in a union or something like that. Yeah. Now, is there a, a border where uh, individuality obviously has its benefits, but also collectiveness also is something that uh, you and I both agree that's pretty important. So where's the border? When, when when, when can we express ourselves to be individual and when should we, you know, be a team player? Um, I love that question. I'm not sure I've got a super um, kind of principled or... Come on, like, tell me something. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had a formula, oh, you know, MC squared or something. Yeah, um, <laughs> okay. Right? But, um, but really it's going to be... I, I, I think we have to recognize the situation. So if um, if the situation is one where um, the you know we're under attack, that's not a good time for your comrade to say something like, 
you know, the way you put that yesterday really irritated me. Right. That's just really bad timing. So and I think so actually, I guess the formula is is for comrades. Are, I mean, basically, I'm, and I'm always thinking about comrade, communist comrades, comrades in a communist party. Right. Not just not military comrades or you know schoolmates or something. But for communist comrades, our eye is always going to be on revolution. And so with that when we have to think about everything that we're doing in light of revolution so in light of our organizing in light of organizing this event or that event in light of the demonstration in light of reaching the people and sometimes we will need to put aside our own fears hopes dreams desires whatever for the sake of the struggle that's why we're doing this other times we need to mention to other people our comrades look my fear here is important for all of us to think about because my fear is that i don't know those cannons in front of us are loaded <laughs> and so you gotta move around um but you gotta know the difference and i think that the, um you gotta know when what you're bringing up matters and part of that, that's a matter of discipline, it's a matter of learning, um, and it's a matter of kind of commitment to the final goals of the struggle. Mm. And obviously, we can re-individualize after we've uh, got our goal of a, you know, communist techno utopia of some kind. Then we can start saying, well, I want to wear this shirt today, I'll, I'll stand out, or, you know, we can maybe think about. But as you're saying, right, at this moment, we've got a long way to go. Also, but it's a, it doesn't even have to be quite that hardcore, right? Like, I don't know, like before I go to bed, I'm not at a rally. <laughs> before I go to bed, I'm going to, I don't know, like, you know, look at Barbie memes, right? That may not be particularly communist of me, but hey, I'm about to go to sleep. This is not like, I feel like um, comradeship is about like dictating people's um, individual lives for the sake of dictating them. I think it's about connecting people in struggle against capitalism and for the creation of an emancipatory egalitarian society. So it's not like, like it doesn't make sense for communists to say, eat this, don't eat this, unless of course you're on a long march and you're having to, you know, ration the food. So yeah. sometimes um, there's a little bit of, of um, moralism and perfectionism on the contemporary left that's like utterly unnecessary. Like I, I, I hate the way people are always policing folks' um, cultural choices. Like why? That doesn't really matter. That <laughs> that's not part of the discipline that you need to be a comrade. Isn't that the one thing that's uh, the, totally subjective that we can actually just give each other a pass? Well, he listens to heavy metal, so fuck that guy. Like, now, come on. Totally, totally. Let's give him a pass. Like, I, I, maybe I just think this though because I have really bad taste in music. Like, I am just like. <laughs> I'm just the worst. Like, like the poppier and schlockier, the better. Right, right. I love. I am guilty of the same. I, but still, that's not the time and the place to. You know, you got to pick your battles ultimately. When, with that's your, right. With your one hundred percent. Well, it's all extra hard for people like me who I'm vegan, but I'm also for you know black emancipation and I'm for gay emancipation. I'm for everybody. As long as you're suffering, I got a I got a heart bleeding for you. Um, but a lot of those groups don't even get along, and they want to exclude each other. And and, and where do you where do you see that playing? A, do, do you see that in you know leftist communities? Yeah, I think that's an important and a hard consideration. Um, so I, let's start with what you were saying. What you, you articulated a, um, a principle that Marx and Engels mention in the Communist Manifesto, which is communists are everywhere on the side of the oppressed. And I think that's a really important um, beginning point. That doesn't mean that we have to tell all everybody who's oppressed, hey, you guys need to get along with each other, right? That's not what the, the thing is that we're supposed to preach. Now, we want to recruit people. And by that, when we recruit people, we would try to say like, hey, don't we see how these struggles actually fit together? That what holds you back is actually what holds me back, right? Or what holds back black women is actually the same set of, of constraints that hold back white men 
white working class men, right? That hold back people who are you know, sexual minorities, that hold back immigrants, that in fact, it's a capitalist system that's trying to say that a small group, because they own things, get to determine what everybody gets. They get to determine how much we work. They get to determine where we live, where we're educated, whether or not we get health care. Like, that's ridiculous. Right. And so I think that part of our, our responsibility isn't like dictating to oppressed people, you should think this way. It's actually it, helping everyone understand how our struggles actually are different fronts in the, fronts in the same struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that sense, it seems like you you would take something like Marxism or, or communism. It seems to be guided heavily by empathy, but at the same time, aren't there a bunch of uh, like a cross section of the population that are biologically just unable to empathize with other people? Wouldn't they be incompatible with uh, our communist revolution? I don't think so, because I actually think you can um, explain the same things in a really robotic way, um, in a really um, kind of machinic way, which, you know, is something like, um, you know, working um, you know, more than eight hours a day, more than four days, I'm going to go now with four day week, um, that is wrong for everyone. It makes you tired. It makes this person tired. It makes it dangerous for pilots and air traffic controllers and nurses. None of us think that having, you know, sleepy pilots and exhausted air traffic controllers and nurses is good for us. And so you may not personally care about them. That's all right. But you can recognize even with all of your, you know, sort of non empathetic ways that that just practically speaking, that's a bad idea. So I think that empathy is good but that's only one way one access point we can use good old-fashioned reasons mm. logic for for those yeah. that need it uh and yeah. the, and the rest that you you just need to get the cart moving and everybody will just jump on it once it's rolling the the, the major i think the majority of the people just fall in line with whatever the thing is so you just have to get some percentage of the people doing it and then the rest will come um I actually, I actually think there's a, there's a, is it Brecht has a line in a poem where something like communism, um, communism is the most obvious thing in the world. It's the easiest thing, the simplest thing. Um, it's the kind of stuff that kids learn in nursery school and kindergarten, um, which is share, right? Which is like, wait your turn, share. Everybody gets this, you know, gets, basically gets the same amount unless somebody really wants some more then maybe their friend will give them a little bit more and somebody really doesn't want it and they don't but we learn these things and then as we get acculturated into a competitive capitalist system it's like beaten out of us but i don't think it's ever fully beaten out of us no there's a sense of beaten out of elon musk but maybe maybe just well they put rich people in an mri and they found that the and they showed them pictures of starving children and the whole Part of their brain didn't light up that would usually light up that would signify that they, that had some impact <laughs> on him so there's that but uh no oh, yeah some people some people but um you also uh, written articles about digital media and how that you know is shaping politics and society so what's your take on this and what's your take are we losing democracy what's happening so i have um a theory that um, we can use with the heading communicative capitalism and the basic idea is that with the rise of personal um, communications media, that democracy and capitalism merged in a particular kind of way. So that, um, and that, and we can think about this in um, an analogy with Marx's discussion in Capital. Marx in Capital talks about use value and exchange value. And so the use value of an item, let's say the use value of a broom is like, oh, I can sweep with it. And its exchange value would be how much it costs or, you know, it's going to be the equivalent of $3. And then, you know, a, a um, I don't know, lipstick will also be $3. And so the exchange value of these things is the same, right? What you can get for it. Under communicative capitalism, what's happened to um, our language, our speech, our, communica our communicative utterances is that they've lost their use value and only have exchange value. 
so that their meaning doesn't really matter. What matters is what how they circulate. So does somebody like something? Do they share it? Do they forward it? Um, do they retweet, you know, re what do you call it now? Retweet it or re-exit? I don't know the words um, for that. But but like, does it go viral or not? And one of the wild things is like, when we think about how communication circulates in so social media, it doesn't really matter anymore what it means. It, it, what The only thing is like, does it get a rise out of someone, whether they like it or don't like it, laughing at it, mocking it, or fully agreeing with it? The only thing that's really mattering is the response, not the content. So under communicative capitalism, we've got a real change in how communication works, how it's functioning for us. This is really hard if you think that democracy, or challenging if you think that democracy requires giving reasons. If you think democracy gives reasons, then this um, communicative capitalism means that that democracy is actually really not possible anymore because people aren't giving reasons. They're just trying to get hits get be, you know um, feed the daily outrage gain popularity gain mind share and one of the interesting things that's been going on is that and so, oh, oh wait let me step back and one other thing that happens with this is that means the difference between a truth and a lie doesn't matter anymore like lies can circulate as easily maybe even more easily than truths can and, and, it's, and you can always do this sort of reflexive move like, oh, well, you say it's a lie. Um, here's the truth. But then I'm going to counter this truth by questioning that. And you keep reflexively questioning ever over and over and over again. So, and those things circulate over and over again so that any kind of basis of, of, of any kind of dem basis that you might have put um, thought democracy would have in giving reasons in some kind of truth, in some kind of you know rationality completely goes away so the the basic idea is that the conditions of possibility for democracy um are utterly eroded under communicative capitalism now what what you know then what happens next that's another question but that's the kind of general thesis is that communicative capitalism makes the the sh shared sense of meaning and truth necessary for a democracy impossible so you're sort of saying that uh, the simplicity and the and the malleability of humans makes it that democracy was never really going to work because we're obviously simple enough to want to pick up a tabloid rather than to know what's in a scientific study. I don't know if I would be quite so negative. Um, I think we can say that um, democracy is not a conversation of everyone. Right. An ideal democracy that that assemblies could make sense. So small groups like the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau thought that, <laughs> that democracy was only going to work in Corsica, which is sort of weird. <laughs> um, uh, he sets up his theory of the social contract. He's like, oh, yeah, here's the idea, but it's only going to work in Corsica. Um, <laughs> but you know, the thought was that but it wasn't he did not have a deliberative idea. He did think that people would have to reflect um, and that they would reflect in a way, though, that was anchored in, you know, particularly things being true and particular understanding of reason and that kind of stuff. So I am um, I I just I think that we can't have something like fully mass democracy. And if we understand that as meaning a conversation of everyone, I think that we can have things like um, assemblies um, and maybe like a jury, a jury can be a pretty democratic institution. Um, but it's noticed it's a really super constrained discussion, right? The rules are always set and the evidence is always set. Um, so I'm not going to dismiss everything, but I think, um, the conditions where everything is constantly, where there's never any certainty possible and everything is constantly undermined, actually undermine the possibility of democracy. Yeah. 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 Well, it ha it has evolved. I think the Greeks also said, you know, it's a good. It's this thing. It's this idea we have. But then most of the time, they go up there and just be using rhetoric on each other to try to convince each other. Not actually. You yeah. dem your democracy is only as good as an educated populace. And if you, you know, if they want to, you know, eat junk food and watch trash sports, and you, you, I don't know how it's going to last. It's interesting to think. Um can't we, I mean, if I, if I wanted to, like, I want to, here's the weird thing in my, like, I want to defend the people that criticize democracy. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? So I want to say that someone can be capable of um, making a, of 
making a rational assessment and watch bad sports and eat junk food. <laughs> but we don't have to choose between those things. But what we do have to do is have um, a, we have to have a, um, a system of media where things are true. We have to have, and we have to have politicians that are not mobile, um, motivated by their own sort of greed, greed, lies, fame. And like, as we've already pointed out, but the Greeks were already facing that problem. Like yeah. the Greeks saw their politicians motivated by the same stuff. But yeah, but talking about the mid, you know, digital media, and as soon as you say, okay, well, we want to clamp down on misinformation, then all these nut bars uh, cite free speech and they're not wrong. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. So what do we do about that? In my view, the problem um, is that we don't, is that it shouldn't be the case that these are companies, they're private corporations, that there should actually be regulated like public utilities owned by, um, essentially owned by the state as public utilities. PBS, folks have never thought that PBS was some sort of horribly censorious state-run thing what they've thought that pbs is is boring <laughs> and, but that seems like boring is better politically yeah, right well they up until a point in britain they uh, didn't underestimate the the intelligence of the people like the, we did with reality shows in the late 2000s but they were actually having the most boring most dry political debates as a uh, strategy to keep people invested into the issues and like Maybe we need to have a test where you need to prove that yeah. you're, you know, tell me you know the issues first and, and the truth about the matter, then we'll let you vote. But then, you know, that's an authoritarian slippery slope. So that's a, historically in the U.S., literacy tests um, were used for segregationist reasons. And so there's a there you go. kind of yeah. bad history there um, on this side. <laughs> Anything could be weaponized immediately, you know. But uh, no, we're in a pickle when, when it comes to media and the economic climate so it's good i'm glad to have you here you're making my day better um, uh, so can i ask you a little bit about ne neo-feudalism the end of capitalism yeah so this is an idea i've been working on kind of a little bit longer like um, than i wish like five or six years now it's taken a long time to get this um, book together this one's been real work um and it started out because of a claim from um, mckenzie work and mckenzie work has a book called um capital is dead and she'd been you know sort of I've, I've seen her make this kind of claim in i don't know online or some various places that what if we're not in capitalism anymore it's something worse and at first i thought that was stupid like what do you mean we're not in capitalism anymore come on like, um, but it, it's like one of those things that started eating at me it kept like just got under my skin and then i'm like like, okay, let's just take it seriously. What if we're not? Now, she has this whole thing about like a vectoral class and all this stuff, which I've never found convincing. That goes back to her, her earlier stuff, the Hacker Manifesto. Um, so I don't buy that. But, but the idea that our system is not quite capitalist anymore, I found persuasive. And then I started reading a bunch of different things. And there's some like right wing people, like a guy named Joel Kotkin has a book on neo-feudalism. Um, and he, the way he describes it is um, essentially that the U.S. is run by, you know, academia plus Hollywood in a green cabal against the fossil fuel sector. Now, if only, you know, the left academia could have this kind of power. Um, so I thought that, that his account was super wrong. But one of the things that he emphasized was the massive service sector. And then I started reading some really super bo great book by Jason Smith. Um, I can't remember the name of it right off the um, top of my head. And then another one by Aaron Bananev. And both of them were talk are talking about the ways that um, the, 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 the general problematic of the um, enormous service sectors um, for economic stagnation. And then I started to think more, you know, I started reading more Robert Brenner and then um, um, a bunch of Marx. And so it's like, okay, I actually am starting to see what our, um, 
what things look like. And and one more thing before I get given more details. Um, during the um, Prop 22 discussion, it was in that's in California. It was an effort. Well, it was at first. It was a bit of legislation to try to say that um, Uber drivers and Lyft and delivery drivers are employees, not independent contractors. Um, and then what happens is Prop 22 passes um, after zillions of dollars thrown in by Uber to con influence this debate. And so they're like, oh, no, they're all, you know, they're all independent contractors. They're not employees, um, which means they don't entitled to any benefits. Um, so this has been legislated in all sorts of different places. And it's still the it's gone through appeal in, in um, earlier this year, an appellate court upheld prop 22 which is really bad um but it still will go to the state supreme court in california which hasn't happened yet um in england it is the case that uber drivers and you know lyft or delivery they're they classified as employees but in parts of the u.s now i don't know how it is in like germany or the netherlands um but in the in the um, some of the one of the rallies around this one of the guys um, who's the speaker of the house in California yell you know he's at a rally and he yells out it's fucking surfed them all over again and so the thing is is that you're all you're seeing and it's been this language is of of serfs and lords and peasants of the internet and tech feudalism this has been floating around in tech sectors for about 10 or 15 years now but what what I'm trying to do is to say these things are fitting together. It's part of one new formation of capital that is not able to make money anymore via production. So the delinking of capital accumulation and production, and instead a kind of predatory political plundering um, approach to accumulation. This plus a large scale scale service sector. Plus this kind of general hinterlandization where you've got like, I don't know, like some winter cities surrounded by all sorts of kind of awful like strip malls and car call centers and warehouses and like decline and sort of depopulation, declining schools, lack of hospitals, um, all of this stuff happening. Um, and then a general sense of apocalypticism. It's like, wow, this actually looks a lot like feudalism and we can effectively call it neo-feudalism to start to think of that capitalism may not be progressing at all but turning into something that's substantially worse so mm. that's the general theory um and i and the thing is, is that one of the things i found is i think that most of us kind of feel this intuitively and so i'm trying to give kind of theoretical legs to this intuitive feeling yeah and how does this term neo-feudalism tie into other terms like right libertarianism and the dark enlightenment and uh yeah. what, what's the other one the um what are the kids into now they're into uh yeah anyway but like yeah. terms terms so, like this yeah i would say that um the, the dark enlightenment folks uh, um, would be a ideological expression of the apocalypticism and catastrophism of neo-feudalism. So there would be one, you know, one um, thread of this or one sector of this, one component of this. So you can com you combine them as like an ideological dimension of larger um, sort of structures of of decline and plunder and political inequality. That'd be one version. The um, some um, people on the right, I'm not sure. Like on the the libertarian side, they fit into the like right wing libertarian side. They fit in because they're in favor of. Of like small islands, like islands where they can do whatever they want, or cryptocurrencies, or zones where they are freed from taxation. Right? That's, there's a really interesting book by Quinn Slobodian called "Cracked Up Capitalism," where he talks about like so he says there's like like five thousand different zones in the world, which is where states have carved out of themselves areas. Where their lies don't, where their laws don't apply. That's really weird, right? Typically, we think of state power as wanting to expand itself, but there's been this phenomenon of state power retrenching or turning in and carving out it, uh, carving gaps out of itself in order to pro to provide free zones for capital. Libertarians love this, and he talks about all these various libertarians. Um, 
some of whom are like it's like Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman's son, Milton Friedman's grandson, some of whom who play like 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 um kind of feudal society for creative anachronism, crazy games. Like they're real whack jobs. Um but they are <laughs> they have a, a it's a kind of libertarian view where feudalism for them actually represents um something positive because they're so anti large state. Um I was just listening to um the uh, podcast from this group, the post-liberal order, and they're kind of Catholic conservatives. And one of the things that when somebody says as a side, oh, well, I know our audience is in favor of you know, some, a more feudal order. And I'm thinking, what? Like, what are you kidding me? Um, but it, it, it is kind of what I, sus what I suspected. So I, again, and I would call that a kind of ideological symptom of this phenomenon that has um, versions in um, economics and changes in the capitalist economy and um, in legally, I didn't even talk about that, like forms of privatized law, privatized jurisprudence where, um, you know, in fact, in, like, for example, the majority of workers in the United States, this is a little known fact, but it's terrible. The majority of workers in the United States have to sign arbitration agreements when they get a job, meaning that if the employer does something to them, they go first to arbitration, they look, they lose a right to sue them or bring charges um, against them in court. And um, under the current, the Supreme Court within the last 10 years upheld that, right? Said that, yes, that's right. A employers can require that. That's some, yeah. that's some dark shit right there. Yeah, it is, right? It's the employer acting like a lord saying that they get to decide the conditions of justice. State law doesn't. I would think we're already under that libertarian sort of thing. We just need to deregulate just a little bit more, and we'll just about be to that hellhole where, and a lot of them are going to benefit from it, so that's why they're saying, oh, yeah, that'll be great. They'll be down there. We'll be up here. Uh, accelerationism was the word I was looking for. Um, yeah, I think um, it's interesting. I, I've never found ex acceleration uh, accelerationism a attractive theory you know some on the left want to think that if you make things bad enough communism will happen you know, I, I i think no like a leninist says um you know you have to organize right it's all about organizing because bad things can happen but that doesn't tell you who wins in the struggles right who wins in the struggles i actually think you know if you're not organized it's going to be the people with the most guns right right really organized then you can maybe you know subvert them but that's not easy historically this is the the problem with leftists just being unarmed and they go after the intellectuals first and the intellectuals got more books than guns and, and it's just over yeah more books than sense <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man i'm so glad you stopped by today look come back and do this again because it was too much fun all right Oh, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Thanks so much. All right. So I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Jody Dean, wonderful human being, uh, professor down there at the uh, Hobart and William Smith Colleges in New York State. You know, you've written 13 books. What's what's Comrade is the latest one. I think that's 2019, an essay on political belonging. What's the next thing? Can you, can so, you give us a hint? Yeah. So the one um, I had an edited volume come out last year called "Organize, Fight, Win." I co-edited that with Sharice Burden Stelly. It's the writings of Black communist women. Um, it's a su it's a super book. Um, it's really it says American Black communist women um, from roughly 1928 to 1956, and my neo feudalism book is going to be called Capital's Grave, and um, it'll be out from Verso. Um, within the next year or two <laughs> <laughs> no pressure no pressure no pressure fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> all right i want to thank jody dean look she'll come back we'll do it again thanks for coming everybody we'll see you next time bye-bye